Does anyone here know how many stars there are in the universe? Astronomers say no one does because no one has enough time to actually count them. That's how many there are. I read an article from 2018, and they say the, the astronomers say they can only give estimates. So they estimate that there are, in each galaxy, average of 100 million stars. Right? That's a lot of stars. Do you know how many galaxies there are? They claim two trillion galaxies. That's a lot of fingers of stars, right? And for sure, 10 billion billion stars in the universe. They say this is a lowball guess. The numbers could shoot upward of 1 billion trillion. Mind-boggling how immense our universe is. And just to put it in perspective, the number of stars that I just gave would be more than the estimated grains of, grains of sand on the Earth. Not just the beaches, but the Sahara Desert, everything, right? Mind-boggling. And what we celebrate today is that our Lord Jesus Christ is king of the universe. He is king of all those stars. But there's an important question for you and I. Is he king of my life? Is he enthroned truly in my heart as king? Our gospel today presents us with paradoxes. The one is that this amazing king of the universe is subjected to the hands of men, nailed to a cross, dying between two criminals. As well, we have three groups of people ridiculing his kingship. And so as I go through these three groups, I ask you to pay attention to the word save. The word save, that verb, shows up four different ways. So we begin with the religious leaders who scoffed at Jesus, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. That's another way of saying the king of Israel. The soldiers mocked Jesus, saying, if you are king of the Jews, save yourself. One criminal kept deriding Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. However, the other criminal, the one that we usually refer to as the good thief, he defends Jesus and even responds to Jesus in faith. This good thief confesses his sins, acknowledges that he deserves to die for them, calls on the name of Jesus, calls on the kingship of Jesus, uh, seeking his mercy and forgiveness, and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Right? Kings have kingdoms. And what does Jesus do? He saves him. Today you will be with me in paradise. So there's the paradox, that by not saving himself from the cross, Jesus saves others, right? that he is Savior. This is his mission, to offer salvation to all through the forgiveness of sins and the reconciliation to the Father. And this is done on the cross through his self-offering, his self-offering sacrifice. When we look at this crucifix, we see the gift of Jesus for me that he was, gave his life unto me for us by offering himself on the altar of the cross as a spotless sacrifice. So these words we're, we're going to hear in the Eucharistic prayer today. I'll repeat them. By offering himself on the altar of the cross as a spotless sacrifice. So the altar of the cross is where Jesus his body was given for us. His blood was poured out for us. Do you recognize that language, an obvious connection to the Eucharist, an obvious connection to this altar of Eucharistic sacrifice? The fact that that crucifix and that altar in proximate uh, position is no coincidence. They are connected. There's an amazing connection here. 
This altar is where that one perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is made present to us. It's not a representation, not a mere symbol, but the actual sacrifice of the cross is made present to us in the sacrament here on the altar, that Jesus becomes present to us, real, actual, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. We see a, a paradox here, again, that in the crucifix, you look at that and you go, oh yeah, that, that kind of looks like a man on a cross. That looks like, like Jesus, but it's not Jesus. It's just a symbol. We look at the consecrated bread and wine, and it doesn't look anything like Jesus, but it is Jesus, right? Truly present to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so we want to pause and reflect on that today. On this, very self, on this very thing, and ask ourselves, how do I respond to Jesus' kingship here in the Eucharist? How do I respond to Jesus' self-offering sacrifice of the cross made present for me in the Eucharist? Do I respond in faith like that good thief with love and worship and reverence to the, the king of the this Eucharistic king, is he king of my life? Is he enthroned in my heart? Or have I become kind of half-hearted or a little maybe indifferent to Jesus' presence as king? Jesus present in the Eucharistic sacrifice, king of the universe. On Thursday night and Saturday morning, Deacon Rod led us in a workshop for all extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. And I spoke about a, a few changes we're making, and there were lots of questions and lots of discussion and comments, and I had conversations afterwards, and I walked away from those workshops just really edified with the thought that Jesus, our Eucharistic King, is loved, worshipped, and reverenced by these good folks. Right? It really warmed my heart. And at both of the workshops, it was suggested that I speak to all of you about the reverence for the Eucharist. So I'm just going to touch on a few things uh, today and uh, hopefully more in the future. So an area of reverence is as we come forward for communion, that we come with a, a modicum of decorum in our behavior, that we make a sign of reverence to the Blessed Sacrament, uh, a bow of the head is, is sufficient. And for those who choose to receive Jesus uh, in, in communion on the hand, I want to read to you something that came from St. Cyril in the mid-fourth century. St. Cyril is, was bishop of Jerusalem and a doctor of the church. There's only 36 doctors of the church, so St. Cyril knows what he's talking about. And he gets very practical for his people, and he says this. He says, In approaching for communion, therefore, come not with your wrists extended and your fingers spread, but make your left hand a throne for the right, as for the, the, that which to receive a king. Make a throne to receive a king. And having hollowed your palm, receive the body of Christ, saying over it, Amen. Right? So just to uh, highlight this a little more, and, and again, if you're left-handed, you know you're special, right? You're a minority, so it makes you special. And But... It doesn't matter which hand, you, but make a throne. We tell the, the uh, I teach the children for First Communion that when you make a throne for Jesus, hold it near your heart so that you can express your love for your Eucharistic King present to you, right? Kids often have a tendency of going like this. Make a throne. Now, Deacon Rod said something uh, in his workshop. He said, use your good Catholic faith and your common sense. So if you're super tall and the communion minister is super short, please don't make us reach up like, like this, right? 
uh, just, but the idea is that it's reverent. It makes a throne, and, and St. Cyril says, receive it in the hollow of your palm, right? So it doesn't slip out. If you receive it in your fingers, it could slip out. So receive it in the palm of your hand, making a throne for our Eucharistic uh, King. And so also talk to the extraordinary ministers who take communion to the sick. So they come forward with uh, this little container called a pix. It's, it's designed specifically for carrying the host and only the host, nothing else. And so we said when you're taking our Lord to the sick, right? There's, the ideal is to go directly after Mass to the sick person. Um, and he said, carry it near your heart, right? Again, we want to love Jesus. We want to have devotion for our Eucharistic King, when we're, especially when we're carrying him. Uh, and so if you have a, a shirt pocket, that's great. And if not, we have pouches with strings on it that it, it hangs near uh, the heart, right? So taking a pix with the host in it, sticking it in our pant pocket, our jacket pocket, our purse, not appropriate, right? Near your heart, express your love. So I came up with this, um, this analogy for the folks. I said, you know, just picture yourself being present at the manger, and our Blessed Mother takes the infant Christ child and hands him to you to hold. Would you take baby Jesus and and hold them like a football down here and just, or, or stick them in your purse and talk to our Blessed Mother while, it, I would hope the Blessed Mother would slap you silly for, you know, that irreverence to Jesus, right? No, you would take the baby Jesus, you would hold them close to your heart, right? So same kind of thing with the extraordinary ministers who take uh, communion out of the church. And the other thing we said is that what we're going to ask, and this is the diocesan norm, is that the extraordinary ministers who have a pix will only receive from the presider at the end of the communion line. So if there's one or ten here, they're going to line up. I'll give them a communion, right? And then they'll, they'll we'll, I'll say, May, may you know Christ's presence with you as you go forth to administer this Holy Communion. And they'll leave that way, and hopefully we'll be leaving this way, and we'll all be seated. We won't be doing the head bow at the end of the communion procession. And so we've instructed the extraordinary ministers here at Mass that if someone shows up during the communion line, right? So what they're supposed to do is come with their family and receive communion, go back to their pew, and then come back as the communion line uh, is ending all together. So I can line them up here and, and give them a uh, host. So what the extraordinary ministers here at Mass have been instructed is to be polite, to be kind, but to be very clear that if you come to them with a pix during communion line, they are to send you packing, okay? To the back of the line, right? They're not going to give you the host. And that also um, begs the, the fact that we want all our communion ministers to attend our training. Uh, we, we have new processes and everything, so we want people to know what we're doing. We want to have care for the Eucharist, right? We it's not all, you know, people have good intentions, but sometimes things happen that aren't in, in order for the proper reverence for the Eucharist. So if you have a pix and you're taking communion outside the church, we need to know who you are and where you're taking our Lord. All right? And so I'll just check my list here. So the other thing, uh, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll mention, is that we talked about is why do we all stand together during communion, right? Or during the communion procession? Why are we all standing together? Well, one of the answers was the Archbishop asked us a number of years to do that. Uh, so, so 
good enough for me. If the Archbishop has asked that, that's what we're doing. And also there's a liturgical significance to standing together. There's liturgical significance to the common posture. It shows our unity as the body of Christ. Right? You're coming forward individually to receive the body of Christ, but together, when we gather for Mass, we become, in a very specific way, the body of Christ. So it expresses the fact that we're in this together. We are part of his body. He is the head. Right? And so when we're coming forward, that's the significance of um, that standing during uh, the communion uh, line. So again, we're just going to eliminate the bow at the end because that rite ends when the last person um, or that liturgical action ends when the last person receives uh, communion. So these are just a few external ways to show reverence to Jesus present in the Eucharist. Right? When you come, if you choose to receive in your hand, make a, a throne for our Eucharistic King. Uh, those who are taking the, the picks uh, and the host carry it close to their heart, go through the appropriate training. They need proper delegation for the, to do this. All right. So these are external, external signs of reverence. But equally, or more importantly, is the inter internal, uh, interior re uh, reverence that we show to uh, Jesus. Right again, we want to love and worship him. We want to enthrone him as king of our lives. We want to enthrone him in our hearts. Jesus is king of the universe. He's king of all those stars in the universe. But he needs our faith response. That faith response like the good thief so that he can be king of our lives.